Good evening. Welcome to our Zoom presentation of Christmas with Dickens, a new twist on an old ghost story, written by Joanna Rotke and directed by Karen Schomburg. Before we begin, I would like to share a few details about today's event. We are using a webinar tool, so there is no chat function. The author and the cast will be available to answer your questions after our presentation. And we invite you to submit your questions into the Q&A box at any time. Closed captioning is available and tonight's event will be recorded. Our cast includes Andrew Davids as Charles Dickens, Frank Whitman as Ebenezer Scrooge, Sarah Kaufman Michael as Mrs. Catherine Dickens, Martha Rabin as Queen Victoria, and Chris Rich as the Ghost of Christmas Present. My name is Mark Messersmith, and I will be reading short selections from the actual text of A Christmas Carol written by Charles Dickens. Now, sit back in a comfy chair in front of your screen and enjoy our little holiday gift to you. Here is Christmas with Dickens, a new twist on an old ghost story. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Charles John Huffam Dickens. I'm sure you all know who I am. I was born in England in 1812. I led an extraordinary life and then I died in 1870. When I died, I was in the middle of my 15th novel, The Mystery of Edwin Drood. That's right. I completed 14 novels, many of which are what you might call classics, including Great Expectations, Oliver Twist, David Copperfield, and Barnaby Rudge. I'm just kidding about the last one. It's not really a classic per se, but it does include a talking raven named Grip and people taking to the streets. So timely. I also wrote plays, I edited magazines, and I walked on a fairly athletic level. Mm. Uh, I, I could go on and on, but tis the season, as they say, and I'm really here to tell you about A Christmas Carol. In 1843, I was a very successful author. My wife, Catherine, was pregnant with our fifth child. My parents were after me for money. I was at odds with my publishers and I was plugging along at a not so very successful novel called The Life and Times of Martin Chuzzlewit. Not the catchiest of titles, huh? My expensive London home was feeling as small as my pocketbook and both were being stretched to their very limits. What's a successful author to do in the face of all this? Well, write his way out, of course. It was either that or move to France. So I decided to write a Christmas book. People love Christmas. So why not get on that bandwagon and write it? Actually, I had a very, a much more philanthropic and downright socialist reason for writing this little book. Things were abysmal in England at the time. That was not my fault. Not my fault. I had only been queen for six years and was newly married. I may have been a monarch and the titular head of a great country, but parliament made the laws. I did give my assent, but merely as a formality. You are correct, your majesty. We cannot lay the blame for all of this in your lap. We were in the midst of an economic disaster. Uh, America was reneging on their debts to us, which only made things worse. Uh, homeless beggars were everywhere and children were dying in factory and mining accidents. I wanted to startle my countrymen into empathy and remind them of their compassion. Parliament needed a wake up call. So I created a main character called Ebenezer Scrooge who was a mean-spirited, miserly, friendless old- I think this is where I come in. And it's about time I was allowed to explain myself. I think I was portrayed rather unfairly in that book of yours. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner hard and sharp as flint, from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire, secret and self-contained and solitary as an oyster. 
The cold within him froze his old features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek, stiffened his gait, made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. A frosty rhyme was on his head, and on his eyebrows, and his wiry chin. He carried his own low temperature always about of him. He iced his office in the dog days and didn't thaw at one degree at Christmas. See what I mean? As long as we're setting something straight, I have a few complaints of my own. It wasn't always puppies and rainbows being married to a famous author. Catherine, this isn't the time nor the place. Well, I always thought your goody two-shoes Mrs. Cratchit was a direct slap in my face. She and her husband, surrounded by a brood of happy children, living their happy little life on Bob's meager salary. Now wait a minute. I paid minimum wage. Close to it anyway, I think. Okay, maybe not. <laughs> I wasn't the only one spending money in our household, you know. And I didn't have 10 children all on my own, dear husband. You had a rather active part in that too. You know, I had nine children in 17 years, though I hated being with child. After Bertie was born, I had hallucinations and feared I was losing my mind. We really should get some wine and talk, Catherine. Consider it a date, your majesty. And if we're going to drink and share child-bearing nightmares, you can simply call me ma'am. First round's on me then, ma'am. Of course I was depressed and often unhappy. Who wouldn't be? I gave birth to 10 children in 15 years and our little Dora never made it to her first birthday. My beloved little sister Mary died suddenly at age 17 for Pete's sake, but was I allowed to grieve? No. Everyone made such a fuss over how broken-hearted you were, Charles. You acted as if something romantic had gone on between the two of you, which is completely false. Mary lived with us to care for me, not you. My brother and my dear grandmother had also recently died. Oh, dear. Oh, I know all about depression. Our first daughter, Vicky, nearly died as a baby. My husband, Albert, was the love of my life. Gone at such a young age. So handsome, so smart. That was a very dark period for me and not easy having to be queen. Well, our fantastical Mrs. Cratchit never complains or gets depressed, does she? She just smiles through everything. Happy to chew on a bone for Christmas dinner, if that's all there is. Happy to have a little ribbon for a gift. Catherine, can we discuss this another time? Hello, ladies. Let's get back to the story. Excuse me, but that entire evening was a complete nightmare for me. I barely survived. I must have eaten something horrible for dinner and fallen asleep by the fire because the next thing I know, my old business partner, Jacob Marley, who was quite dead, mind you, was standing in the room and lecturing me. Marley, in his pigtail, usual waistcoat, tights and boots, the tassels on the ladder bristling like his pigtail and his coat skirts and the hair upon his head. The chain he drew was clasped about his middle. It was long and wound around him like a tail and it was made of cash boxes keys, padlocks, ledgers, deeds, and heavy purses wrought in steel. His body was transparent so that Scrooge, looking through his waistcoat, could see the two buttons on his coat behind. Though he looked the phantom through and through and saw it standing before him, though he felt the chilling influence of its death-cold eyes and marked the very texture of the folded kerchief bound about its head and chin, he was still incredulous and fought against his senses. So creepy. It is required of every man, the ghost of Marley returned. 
that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. It is doomed to wander through the world and witness what it cannot share, but might have shared on earth and turned to happiness. I wear the chain I forged in life, replied Marley. I made it link by link and yard by yard. I girded it of my own free will, and of my own free will I wore it. I was trying to make the point that people should do good in the world and help others while they're alive and not just hoard their wealth. Marley had regrets about his pursuit of money. Fine, the man had regrets. Does he have to share them with me? Am I not allowed a decent night's sleep? No! As soon as I get in bed, some bell starts ringing. Another ghost appears and drags me off into my past. You'd think there'd be some sympathy for me. Did you all not see that I was left alone at school, abandoned by my family? By the way, that sounds an awful lot like your family, Dickens. But I don't see you having nightmares. And yes, I did make a few bad choices when it came to getting married and having kids. Not everyone's cut out for that. I had a business to run. You had a little business to run. Hello, I was running an entire empire. I was married and I had children. Oh, snap. I beg your pardon, your majesty, but you also had an army of servants. Scrooge, this is a story about redemption. How can you be redeemed if everybody likes you at the very beginning? Like me? They never even had the chance. You were the big celebrity in 1843, though you were slipping. Things were looking a little grim, weren't they? Did it make you nervous? Remind you of when your parents were in debtor's prison? Let's take another look at that little schoolboy. Nice of you to place him in a school instead of a blacking factory, eh? They went the ghost and Scrooge across the hall to a door at the back of the house. It opened before them and disclosed a long, bare, melancholy room, made barer still by lines of plain wooden benches and desks. At one of these, a lonely boy was reading near a feeble fire, and Scrooge sat down upon a bench and wept to see his poor forgotten self as he used to be. A door opened, and a little girl, much younger than the boy, came darting in and put her arms about his neck. I have come to bring you home, dear brother, said Fanny, to bring you home, home, home. Home, little fan, returned the boy. Yes, home for good and all. I loved school, and I hated to give it up for that wretched pit of a shoe polish factory. And yes, I did have a sister named Fanny. Let's get back on track and talk about the book itself. I took such great pride in designing the look of it, the beautiful red cover and the green end papers, the gilded edges. My little ghost story was not my only gift to the world. I wanted the book itself to be treasured as well. That didn't quite work out though, did it? That book nearly bankrupted us because it cost so much to publish. But you always did appreciate lovely things. I thought the gilding was a nice touch, actually. Thank you, thank you, Catherine. That means a lot coming from you. Beautiful packaging or not, you called it a ghost story for Christmas. And I'm the one who was made to suffer for it. I even had to relive that terrible moment when my fiance broke off our engagement. He was not alone, but sat by the side of a fair young girl in a black dress, in whose eyes there were tears, which sparkled in the light that shone out of the ghost of Christmas past. It matters little, she said softly, to you very little. Another idol has displaced me, and if it can cheer and comfort you in time to come as I would have tried to do, I have no just cause to grieve. 
What idol has displaced you, he rejoined. A golden one. I have seen your nobler aspirations fall off one by one until the master passion, gain, engrosses you. Have I not? Our contract is an old one made when we were both poor and content to be so. That which promised happiness when we were one in heart is fraught with misery now that we are two. I release you. May you be happy in the life you have chosen. I was trying to juggle my career and a private life. And one or the other was going to suffer. You of all people should be able to understand that, Mr. Paid by the Word. Ah, when is that myth going to die? I was not paid by the word, but I worked very hard at my writing because that was my living and I had people depending on me. And here we go again. Who had to balance the household accounts, hire and look after staff, entertain, give birth, and care for our children? I once had talent. Do you think I enjoyed going from being the popular Miss Catherine Hogarth to becoming simply the wife in the shadow of the inimitable? You were always shut up in your study for hours on end. We had plenty of dinner parties and lots of friends. Mostly your friends. Someone has to keep their nose to the grindstone. We can't all be Mr. and Mrs. Fezziwig throwing parties for our employees with punch and dancing. Oh, I do love a good party. Although I often had no idea who the guests were. We always had lovely big ballrooms, but the dancing was very formal. There were more dances and there was cake and there was a great piece of cold roast and there were mince pies and plenty of beer. But the great effect of the evening came after the roast when the fiddler struck up Sir Roger de Coverley. Then old Fezziwig stood out to dance with Mrs. Fezziwig, top couple too, with a good stiff piece of work cut out for them. Three or four and 20 pair of partners, people who were not to be trifled with, people who would dance and had no notion of walking. It was a small matter, said the ghost of Christmas past, to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. He has spent but a few pounds of your mortal money, three or four, perhaps. Is that so much that he deserves this praise? It isn't that spirit, said Scrooge. The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost a fortune. I loved that job, but I wanted to make my own way. And maybe I had to scrimp and claw a little to get there. Well, you should have looked for sponsorship. That's what I did. I have become the Amazon Prime ghost of Christmas present. Life is much easier now. All of that abundance I surrounded myself with in the book, where do you suppose that came from? <laughs> now I just order it all online and it ships for free. <laughs> oh, God. It's that big crazy fella, the ghost of Christmas present. Another bell, another nightmare. It was Scrooge's own room. There was no doubt about that, but it had undergone a surprising transformation. Heaped upon the floor were turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn, great joints of meat, suckling pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red hot chestnuts, cherry cheeked apples, juicy oranges, luscious pears, immense cakes, and seething bowls of punch that made the chamber dim with their delicious steam. So, you sold out, after all. Oh, no. I've simply adapted with the times and taken advantage of new technology. My heart is the same. Unlike you, I was described as having a kind, generous, hearty nature and a sympathy with all poor men. While you isolated and withdrew yourself, craving money, yet never enjoying or sharing any of it. You can't really complain about our little adventure, can you? <laughs> I showed you how people, no matter how meager their means, enjoy Christmas and share the celebration with loved ones. I was the good spirit, sprinkling blessings and light from my torch and 
trying to keep my robe from flying open. You know, I don't wear anything under it. You were always my favorite spirit. Maybe it was the robe. There was something about you that was quite royal. Why, thank you, your majesty. Well, heir of royalty or not, you have a terribly nasty and sarcastic nature. Don't you remember throwing my words back at me when I quite sincerely asked if Tiny Tim would live? I see a vacant seat, said the ghost, in the poor chimney corner, and a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, none other of my race will find him here. What then? If he be like to die, he had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Scrooge hung his head to hear his own words quoted by the spirit and was overcome with penitence and grief. Man, said the ghost, if you be man in heart, forbear that wicked cant until you have discovered what the surplus is and where it is. Will you decide what men shall live, what men shall die? It may be that in the sight of heaven, you are more worthless and less fit to live than millions like this poor man's child. Yes, you're right. I do have a devilish streak and the driest sense of humor. Mr. Dickens can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we were still on the path of redeeming you. Yes, I'm afraid I had to shame you a bit, Scrooge, in order to make you see. It wasn't so much you personally, Ebenezer, I wanted to shame all of those people who think only of themselves at Christmas and close up their hearts. Christmas time, or in your case, the whole year long. I paid taxes. I supported workhouses and prisons. Can I help it if I am a genius and strong while poor people are simply stupid and lazy losers? People made fun and insulted me. It should be Christmas Day, I'm sure, said Mrs. Cratchit, on which one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, hard and feeling man as Mr. Scrooge. <laughs> oh, I forgot that part. Maybe Mrs. Cratchit isn't as bad as I thought. I could have used that quote of hers to describe you after our separation, Charles. And while we're on the subject of adventures, Mr. Scrooge, Let's talk about my husband dragging me off to America in 1842 and leaving my four very young children behind in the care of his younger brother. Do you want to talk about nightmares? We nearly drowned at sea. I spent most of the face, most of the trip with a swollen face because of a bad tooth, not to mention we went to Cincinnati. Oh, you know, my husband once had our entire family whisked off to the Isle of Wight. Not quite as bad as Cincinnati, but still. Are you only here to complain, Catherine? It must be five o'clock somewhere. Can't you ladies go off and have your little spite fest somewhere else? Oh my, very touchy, Mr. Dickens. You know, I could have had you move to the tower for such comments. And as for spite fest, I think we can all agree that you were quite terrible to the mother of your children. And I, for one, was quite appalled. She did nothing to deserve such ill treatment. Thank you, ma'am. Our wine can wait. My role is to add some context and toss in the odd fact here and there. And yes, if Scrooge is complaining about mistreatment, I'm just saying I have some very legitimate grievances of my own. You destroyed my relationship with my other sister, Georgina, and made a spinster out of her. She might have married and had children of her own, but you usurped her life. Georgina devoted herself to you like a wife until you died. And only then did she reconcile with me. Wives, children, whatever. This is about me. I even went to a party where several people made fun of me and laughed. Is that what Christmas is about? Although I must say my sister Fanny's boy, Fred, did stand up for me in his own way. 
but it was still a harsh teasing. He said that Christmas was a humbug as I live, cried Scrooge's nephew. He believed it too. <laughs> More shame for him, Fred, said Fred's wife, indignant. Oh, bah, humbug. <laughs> bah, humbug. People now come up to me and demand that I say it. They get such a kick out of it. He's a comical old fellow, said Scrooge's nephew. That's the truth, and not so pleasant as he might be. However, his offenses carry their own punishment, and I have nothing to say against him. I'm sure he's very rich, Fred, hinted his wife. At least you always tell me so. What of that, my dear, said Scrooge's nephew. His wealth is of no use to him. He doesn't do any good with it. He doesn't make himself comfortable with it. He hasn't the satisfaction of thinking that he is ever going to benefit us with it. I am sorry for him. I couldn't be angry with him if I tried. Who suffers by his ill whims? Himself, always. Here he takes it into his head to dislike us and he won't come and dine with us. The consequence of his taking a dislike to us and not making merry with us is that he loses some pleasant moments which could do him no harm. I mean to give him the same chance every year, whether he likes it or not, for I pity him. Pity? Bah, humbug! Ooh, oops, sorry, old habits, you know. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to the old man. Mm, whatever he is, said Fred. He wouldn't take it from me, but he may have it, nevertheless. To Uncle Scrooge. <laughs> That was a very nice toast to you, don't you think? Well, it does turn quite dark after that. I don't know why I had to suffer so much and be made to stand in for all the cold-hearted money grubbers out there. I mean, they were my people, but I didn't see them having such an evening. From the foldings of its robe, the ghost of Christmas present brought two children, wretched, abject, frightful, hideous, miserable. They knelt down at its feet and clung upon the outside of its garment. They were a boy and a girl, yellow, meager, ragged, scowling, wolfish, but prostrate too in their humility. Where graceful youth should have filled their features out and touched them with its freshest tints, a stale and shriveled hand like that of age had pinched and twisted them and pulled them into shreds. Where angels might have sat enthroned, devils lurked and glared out menacing. No change, no degradation, no perversion of humanity in any grade through all the mysteries of wonderful creation has monsters half so horrible and dread. Oh yes. The two children called Ignorance and Want. This, this is the very heart of my story. We're really getting there now. If children are our future, then we must educate them and provide a way out of poverty and destitution. The 1840s in England were a decade dominated by deprivation and hardship, but few people were aware of how widespread and persistent it was. The, the realization that I could link Christmas with this great issue of poverty was momentous. I was horrified after all those children died in the Husker Pit mine disaster. Most of them not even 12 years old. I set up a royal commission and parliament finally passed some laws. I also donated 2,000 pounds to Irish famine relief. Bob Geldof would be proud, your majesty. This is where I left you, Scrooge. You have to admit, we had quite the adventure. <laughs> I tried to show you the value of a seasonal conviviality, the value of a time when it's customary for families to live their lives together, to share what they have in common, to sense the continuous narrative of their joint lives and take strength from it. All while social distancing this year, unfortunately. But then it just turns ugly. What sort of devious mind makes a man witness his own death? And I had to travel around with that creepy specter in the black robe, the ghost of Christmas yet to come, not saying anything, just pointing that bony hand at everything. 
the phantom slowly, gravely, silently approached. When it came near him, Scrooge bent down upon his knee, for in the very air through which this spirit moved, it seemed to scatter gloom and mystery. It was shrouded in a deep black garment, which concealed its head, its face, its form, and left nothing of it visible save one outstretched hand. But for this, it would have been difficult to detach its figure from the night and separate it from the darkness by which it was surrounded. He felt that it was tall and stately when it came beside him, and that its mysterious presence filled him with a solemn dread. He knew no more, for the spirit neither spoke nor moved. He certainly is the stuff of nightmares. I don't envy you, Scrooge. I am made to view my own dead body lying on a bed in a bare room that's been stripped of everything valuable by my housekeeper, including my bed curtains. She even took my one good shirt. I get to listen to colleagues speak as if my death means nothing to them. The spirit stopped beside one little knot of businessmen. Observing that the hand was pointed to them, Scrooge advanced to listen to their talk. No, said a great fat man with a monstrous chin. I don't know much about it either way. I only know he's dead. When did he die? inquired another. Last night, I believe. It's likely to be a very cheap funeral, said the same speaker. Report my life. I don't know of anybody to go to it. <laughs> Suppose we make up a party and volunteer. I don't mind going if a lunch is provided, observed the gentleman with the growth on his nose, but I must be fed. What about the tragic death of that little boy, Tiny Tim? His poor family was so bereft. I used to cry always during that scene. They were very quiet again. At last, Mrs. Cratchit said, and in a steady, cheerful voice that only faltered once, I have known him walk with, I have known him walk with Tiny Tim upon his shoulder very fast indeed. <laughs> and so have I, cried Peter. Often. So have I, exclaimed another. So had all. But he was very light to carry, she resumed, intent upon her work. And his father loved him so that it was no trouble. <laughs> no trouble. And there is your father at the door. I wish you could have gone, said Bob. It would have done you good to see how green a burial place it is. But you'll see it often. I promised him that I would walk there on a Sunday. My little, little child, cried Bob. My little child. He broke down all at once. He couldn't help it. He left the room and went upstairs into the room above, which was lighted cheerfully and hung with Christmas. There was a chair set close beside the dead child, and there were signs of someone having been there lately. Poor Bob sat down in it, and when he had thought a little and composed himself, he kissed the little face. Oh, sure. A tragic little scene. Yes, I admit the mourning over Tiny Tim was much different. All of this death and darkness, and to top it off, that spooky specter made me kneel down at my own grave. I saw my very own name on my tombstone. He was not much fun to be with, I can assure you. Yes, but then the nightmare's over, and you wake up on Christmas morning, and everything's wonderful, and you're happy, and you resolve to change your ways. The spirits have shown you a better way to be. The bedpost was his own. The bed was his own. The room was his own. Best and happiest of all, the time before him was his own to make amends in. I will live in the past, the present, and the future, Scrooge repeated as he scrambled out of bed. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. Oh, Jacob Marley, heaven and that Christmas time be praised for this. I say it on my knees, old Jacob, on my knees. He was so fluttered and so glowing with his good intentions that his broken voice would scarcely answer to his call. 
He had been sobbing violently in his conflict with the spirit, and his face was wet with tears. Remember, you made that large charitable donation, and you had dinner at Fred's house. You had a very Merry Christmas, after all. And you and Tiny Tim were both very much alive. Yes. <laughs> I, I sent that turkey to the Cratchits for their dinner and surprised Bob with a raise in his salary the next day. <laughs> it was so much fun to see the look on his face when he, he thought <laughs> I was going to sack him. <laughs> and instead, I gave him more money. <laughs> Priceless. But Scrooge was early at the office next morning. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late, that was the thing he had set his heart upon. And he did it. Yes, he did. The clock struck nine. No Bob. A quarter past. No Bob. He was full 18 minutes and a half behind his time. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come in. His hat was off before he opened the door, his comforter too. He was on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. Hello, growled Scrooge in his accustomed voice, as near as he could feign it. What do you mean by coming here at this time of day? I am very sorry, sir, said Bob. I am behind my time. You are, repeated Scrooge. Yes, I think you are. Step this way, sir, if you please. It's only once a year, sir, pleaded Bob. It shall not be repeated. I, I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. Now, I'll tell you what, my friend, said Scrooge. I am not going to stand this sort of thing any longer. Therefore he continued, leaping from his stool and giving Bob such a dig in the waistcoat that he staggered back. And therefore, I am about to raise your salary. Bob trembled and got a little nearer to the ruler. He had a momentary idea of knocking Scrooge down with it, holding him and calling to the people in the court for help and a straight waistcoat. A Merry Christmas, Bob, said Scrooge, with an earnestness that could not be mistaken as he clapped him on the back. A merrier Christmas, Bob, my good fellow, than I have given you for many a year. I'll raise your salary and endeavor to assist your struggling family. And we will discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking bishop, Bob. Make up the fires and buy another coal scuttle before you dot another eye, Bob Cratchit. So heartwarming and such good news about Tiny Tim. I do love a good story with a happy ending during the holidays. You know, they say that you invented Christmas, Mr. Dickens, but I would argue that it was my dear Albert and I who did. With all due respect, Your Majesty, you should know better. How could you or I invent Christmas? It's a holiday already over a thousand years old and based on an even older pagan celebration. It's pure nonsense, although I did enjoy the, the notoriety for it. But certainly people were celebrating Christmas in England, maybe not just as I described it in the book. I did not set out to invent Christmas. I set out to use Christmas to remind people of what it's about, being with loved ones caring for those less fortunate, sharing joy and happiness and one's good fortune. Don't forget presents, <laughs> lots of presents. We can thank Prince Albert for that. He also brought the tradition of the Christmas tree from his home in Saxe Coburg, wherever that is. He made it a more festive and happy time. We did have some happy Christmases when the children were little. Whatever people say about you, Charles, myself included, you certainly did take up several causes of the poor, including that home for fallen women. I believe they're called sex workers these days. <clears throat> Catherine, uh, totally inappropriate right now, but thank you for the kudos. I also went after those ragged schools, those horrible places that pretended to educate children. But let's get back to my book. I came here to talk about my book. 
It suddenly took off. It practically had a life of its own. I'll even bet that now when people hear about A Christmas Carol, they think of me rather than you. I did make you immortal, Scrooge. Not so sure I liked being portrayed by Mr. Magoo, though. Or the Smurfs. <laughs> but every year people can count on seeing several film versions and many of them are quite good, although they do take liberties. On the subject of liberties, can we talk about your affair with that young girl, Ellen Ternan? The Me Too movement would have a field day with you. My dear Albert had very high moral standards and would never have betrayed me for anyone, let alone a common actress. Good to know some famous men take their marriage vows very seriously. Oh, for Pete's sake. Let's just cut to my redemption and the happy ending, shall we? Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city knew, or any other good old city, town, or borough in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but he let them laugh, and little heeded them. For he was wise enough to know that nothing ever happened on this globe for good, at which some people did not have their fill of laughter in the outset. And knowing that such as these would be blind anyway, he thought it quite as well that they should wrinkle up their eyes in grins as have the malady in less attractive forms. His own heart laughed, and that was quite enough for him. It was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well, if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that be truly said of us, and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. The end. In approximately one minute, we will begin the Q&A portion of our presentation. We will be joined by Joanna Rotke, our author, and Renee Fox, co-director of the Dickens Project at UCSC. My name is Renee Fox and I am the co-director of the Dickens Project, as we just heard. Um, and I am so excited to be able to ask Joanna Rotkey, the writer of this play, questions. Um, as uh, many of you are talking about how much you love this play and how fabulous it was. So I will, I will echo all of that praise and tell you how fabulous it is. Um, one of the questions that somebody has just asked though, which is also a question that I had, Joanna, um, is a question about why you were inspired to um, to include Queen Victoria in your play. This is a question from, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, from Teague Tubach. Um, what, what made you put Queen Victoria in as a character? Well, when I went about rewriting it, um, one of the goals was to beef up the parts and Tiny Tim had a tiny part. So we dropped Tiny Tim, but I thought I should add someone else. And initially I thought that the conflict would be between Queen Victoria and Charles Dickens over who invented Christmas. But then as soon as I added Queen Victoria, I realized that the real relationship was between her and Catherine, that they had a lot in common um, and that they could share uh, not only their childbirth nightmares, but um, just common experiences. Um, so, and it was just kind of a lark to throw in the queen, you know, it was fun. Um, I would just um, encourage people to, to add your questions to the Q&A if you want to add questions. Um, but I'd also like to ask you if you could talk to us a little bit more about Catherine Dickens, um, because so many of the you know, there are a million Christmas Carol adaptations in the world and several of them include Charles Dickens himself as a character and are really interested in his biography and, you know, in the way that the various characters in the play are potentially related to his biography. But for you, it was clearly important as you were just saying when you were talking about Queen Victoria to have Catherine Dickens be central. And 
I might argue, ap apologies, Mr. Dickens, um, that Catherine is maybe the most central character in this particular version of the play. Um, so could you just maybe talk a little bit about why, you know, why Catherine, why the women, why, you know, why make this adaptation of a book that really has very few women in it, mostly about the women? I think when I was doing research on the book initially, um, A Christmas Carol, and looking at the context of what Dickens was doing when he was writing uh, the book in 1843, um, Catherine just started to really gain importance for me. And then I read Lillian Nader's fabulous book, The Other Dickens. And I realized that Catherine is just kind of a neglected person. Um, and her story is really important. Um, and I just, I love Catherine. I love all the Hogarth sisters. Um, they were just fabulous women. So um, I added her in order to just piss off Dickens, I think, during this. <laughs> just give him a smack down. Um, but yeah, Catherine's a really, she's an important character. And the whole story of their, their marriage, their separation, the things that Charles did to her during the separation, um, especially around her children. Um, it's just, um, it was just fascinating to me. And I just thought it was something I wanted to talk about. That's awesome. Many of the people are, are asking questions about Catherine. She's, she's clearly a character and a person that people are really interested in. Um, but one question that I, I wanted to ask um, that comes from Erica, Erica Mayer, um, she asked if Charles or Catherine Dickens ever met Queen Victoria, um, if there was any interaction, if there was any, you know, any sense that this, um, that Queen Victoria, you know, was a, a real character in their lives. Um. Gosh, I wish we could consult Bob Patton here. Um, I, when I, I actually Googled, did Queen Victoria ever meet um, Charles Dickens? And I forget the answer. But Bob was, uh, Bob actually told me that when Dickens died in 1870, Queen Victoria sent her uh, condolence card not to, uh, Charles Dickens Jr., you know, the oldest child, or, but she sent it directly to Catherine. Um, so kind of a bonding thing there. Um, Don Urbanus wants to know how you settled on just six characters, given how many characters there are in the book, you know, how many ghosts are not, are not characters in this play. How did you, how did you settle on just six? Well, Initially, when Karen and I talked about doing this in 2018 with Willing Suspension Armchair Theater, her reader's theater group, um, we wanted to keep it small. We wanted to keep it to six characters because if you put a lot of people on stage in a reader's theater thing, it gets a little clunky and confusing. So we just, I just pared it down. Um, and I just thought the ghost of Christmas present is kind of, well, he's the more interesting spirit. He's the happy spirit. He embodies Christmas. Um, and then when I hit on, you know, making him the Amazon Prime ghost of Christmas present, um, yes. it was just even more fun and more appropriate. So <laughs> I love that there's an Amazon Prime ghost of Christmas present. <laughs> um, he visits all of us every year. <laughs> and it would have been very difficult to include the ghost of Christmas yet to come in a reader's theater. <laughs> yeah, he has no lines. Also, it's kind of hard to have someone flying through a Zoom screen. Um, one of the things that, that um, one of our audience members, Bruce Cotter, said is that he really appreciates you including the role of the reader in this version. Um, 
as he points out, so many of the movies focus on the dialogue and they leave out all of the amazing passages that Dickens wrote as part of their narration of the story. So, you know, the idea that that it, it's about what people say rather than about the way that Dickens was contextualizing all of that and, and you know, really you know, beautifully and in many cases, quite frighteningly um, narrating. So, um, so he didn't quite, um, I'm just curious about why you chose to include the reader if if the reader is you know is meant to just give us a way to showcase some of Dickens really beautiful and amazing language um or if there are other other things going on with having having a reader I mean it's a it's a theater so. well initially again back in 2018 when Karen and I discussed this I was just going to adapt to Christmas Carol um for a reading you know uh, the Willing Suspension Group was just going to read an adaptation of A Christmas Carol. Um, and then I went off on this tangent, but the book is so beautiful. The writing is so beautiful that I couldn't leave it out. And I wanted it to kind of advance the story. So people still got the story of A Christmas Carol while all this other stuff was going on. Um, and just to hear Dickens' language um, and come to appreciate so much of it. My favorite thing is the very beginning where he's describing Scrooge. Um, and there's so much of that, you know, when we introduce the ghost of Christmas present, there's that same repetitive, you know, uh, text about all the stuff in the room and it goes on and on. And, um, it's just a, it's a great book, um, which could segue, segue me into um, talking about next summer's Dickens universe, if you wanted to plug that. I would like to plug that, but why don't we plug that at the end? Okay. Um, there's a question that came from Anya Finke, which is, I think, a question for Karen Schomburg, our director, and also, you know, also for Joanna and for, um, for our actors. Um, a question about the rehearsal process. Uh, please describe a little bit about the rehearsal process on Zoom. You know, this is such a weird, complicated world we're living in. Um, you know, especially per timing with Zoom lag. Did you have backup plans in case a performer's internet went out? Like how, how did all of you cope with the world of trying to produce this beautiful play on Zoom? Well, we had a number of rehearsals in a Zoom rehearsal, not a webinar, but a, a Zoom meeting that uh, Courtney at uh, UCSC at the Dickens Project set up for us. And uh, we worked, if you could have seen the first rehearsal and then seen today's performance, it was, I mean, talk about transitions and growth and change and adaptation. I mean, moving people from one room to another in their house and hanging curtains and trying backgrounds and not backgrounds. And um, uh, then finding out um, where the characters are in their heads and stuff. Uh, and notes going back and forth via email and uh, fi finding and losing rehearsal videos uh, but it, it worked. I think it worked pretty well. Uh, my actors were amazing. Every one of them just absolutely amazing. Uh, taking notes, giving notes back to me, giving me feedback. And um, I think I've, and Anya Finko, by the way, uh, I wanna thank you for coming in and, and enjoying the show. I don't know, anyone that have anything to add? Did I answer the question? I think you did. I'd love to hear just if any of the actors have any have any thoughts about trying to trying to port yourself into Zoom for this. You know, it's I think it's what struck me in the middle of this particular performance is that all of us are on stage when we're doing this. So anything can happen in our backgrounds that will affect the entire performance. So Karen, you worked very hard on, on the lighting and making sure that we weren't too, you know, because while I was describing um, mince pies and all that sound, we literally had some delivery driver deliver <laughs> something to the duplex next door and it set off their little dog. So their little dog is like, 
Kala. against all of their curtains. And I'm thinking, oh, nobody's going to hear me say plum pudding. They're just hearing this dog going off. But it's all, you know, off stage. It just, it, there's just that thin line where reality can come in from any number of places. That, and I think that that's a little disconcerting as a, a stage actor. I did, however, um, to answer the last part of your question, this morning I had the thought, oh my goodness, several of the people live in the mountains here in Santa Cruz County, where if the wind blows, you lose your electricity. And I lost electricity for a minute or two this morning. Um, and I thought, well, if we lose Frank and Martha or Andrew, Mark can read the men's uh, <laughs> parts and I can read the women's parts but I neglected to tell anyone else that other than Joanna so I'm glad the wind didn't do its worst <laughs> might have been good to know it's also very bizarre it's also very bizarre to um, leave your house and walk into a room and then all of a sudden you're performing I don't know if I should, you guys mm. felt this way but there's something about normally going to the theater and getting yourself prepared in this special space and it just seems right and it's such a weird thing to to step into, you know, someone's bedroom here and um, and just say we're on, you know, and, and try to shut out the rest of the world. And so it did take a different level of concentration. And uh, this whole thing is very bizarre. But I think we're learning ways to listen to each other and have some sort of connection, even though it's, you know, not eye to eye. Yeah, uh, uh, from an actor's perspective, that was maybe one of the more challenging things because on a stage or, or even on camera, we're accustomed to looking our scene partner in the eye and making a connection visually, kinesthetically. But in this medium, you can't even look. It's like right now I'm looking at Chris who plays the ghost and like obviously I'm not looking at the camera. So it's about learning how to kind of use your imagination and, and open up your sphere of awareness using your listening skills in a whole new way and just pretending that this green dot that I'm staring at is a human being. <laughs> and then there's no audience to feed on either. So it's like you, you don't get those reactions. You don't get that energy coming back at you. So it's kind of like you have to supply everything. Right, and everybody's camera was in a slightly different spot and trying to, we finally figured out that we needed them to have their script up on the computer and their Zoom room minimized in order for them to be looking towards the audience. And then Mark had the brilliant idea of making his background on his script black and the writing white so we didn't get so much light on his face. Um, so, I mean, it was so many different stages. I feel like you guys are describing my classes, my classroom crisis for like the entire semester. <laughs> All of these things sound very, very familiar, except in far less public spaces um, right. for me, I mean. Um, so just before we, we keep going to questions, somebody asked if maybe uh, the actors could introduce themselves again or if, or if the actors could be introduced again. Can we, can we hear your names again? Okay, there is, uh, I'll read them from the script since I have the page right in front of me. We have uh, Andrew Davids. Yes, Andrew Davids as Charles Dickens. Hello. Thank you, guys. Frank Whitman as Ebenezer Scrooge. Sarah Kaufman Michael as Catherine Dickens. Martha Rabin as Queen Victoria. Mm -hmm. Chris Rich as the Ghost of Christmas Present and Mark Messersmith as the reader. Thank you all. Um, I have I've just lost who asked this question, but somebody asked a question um, for Joanna about whether or not, so a version of this play um, was written last year, but you've clearly revised it and you've done some different things. So um, the question was whether or not, oh, I see this, it's, it's Don Urbanus. Um, he asked if this play was a direct response to COVID. Um, he also says that he really misses the theater and that this is a this is a great response. But are there things that you did in the way you revised it that were explicitly in response to COVID or or <laughs> Karen is laughing hysterically? I feel like that's a good answer. Um, <laughs> what tell us about COVID? 
Um, I threw in some lines. You know, at one point, the ghost of Christmas present mentions socially, socially distancing um, this year. Um, I threw in some subtle, maybe not so subtle jabs at uh, Trump. Um, but when I wrote this originally in 2018, it was really um, because the Dickens Project, I felt that the Dickens Project hadn't really taken advantage of the connection between Dickens and Christmas. Um, and so I wanted to produce something for the holidays um, that involved Dickens. So um, that was the original intent in 2018. And then when I, we didn't do it last year just because I started working at the SPCA. Um, I just didn't have time to do rewrites. And then this year um, I decided to take it up again. Um, and just threw everything I had at it. It was fun. Um, there are several questions here that are about Georgina Hogarth. Um, so, you know, clearly there's a lot of Hogarth women love in the room. Um, so there's one question about whether or not Charles Dickens and Georgina had an affair um, or what the nature of their relationship was. Um, you also, at the very end of the play, um, Catherine, you mentioned, you mentioned Ellen Turnin, um, uh, and there's some questions about Dickens' faithfulness, but, um, but specifically about his relationship to, the, to the, the other Hogarth women, if you could maybe talk a little bit about that and, um, you know, beyond what you, you mentioned in the play about, about Charles kind of sucking Georgina's life force and future out of her. <laughs> yeah, Georgina, man. Georgina stuck with Charles to the very end, um, um, till his dying moment, actually. Um, and didn't reconcile with her sister until um, after Dickens' death. Um, Mary, who had gone to live with them when she was 17 or 16, she didn't live with them for very long, um, died very suddenly in Dickens' arms and he took a ring off her finger and wore it for the rest of his life. Um, which if you were married to the man, I think would have been really disturbing. Um, the, the Hogarth sisters were just, uh, I feel like I can't read enough about them. They were just really interesting women who just became completely overshadowed by Dickens. So I would encourage everybody to go either read Lillian Nader's book or just read anything about um, the, three, the three amazing Hogarth sisters. Somewhere in my mind is to do another reader's theater thing using the letters of the three sisters um, and focus on them. That actually um, leads very well into a question that, um, that Murray Baumgarten has asked via Sheila Baumgarten. Um, whether or not you would consider expanding the play or making it longer, and I'll add, based on what you just said, you know, having a spinoff play. Yeah, I think a spinoff. Um, I don't know that the play needs to be longer, um, especially via Zoom, as far as people um, sitting through something that's, you know, on their screen much longer. But yeah. I think I would definitely love to write something about Catherine and her sisters. Um, stick around, see what happens. Stay tuned. <laughs> um, well, we are coming to the end of our time here. Um, so Joanna, do you, wanna, do you wanna do our Dickens Universe plug for the summer? Oh, I think you should plug the universe for the summer as co-director. <laughs> well, this summer, um, our original plan way back when we could, you know, 
interact with each other in person had been to do a Dickens universe on David Copperfield and the African-American writer Francis E.W. Harper's novel, Iola Leroy, and talk about the intersections between Dickens and African-American fiction. But we decided that since we can't be in person, we would much rather have that universe postponed till 2022. Um, so instead this year we are doing a virtual Dickens universe that is going to be Christmas in July and we're going to be focusing on a Christmas Carol and we're going to be doing a lot with Christmas Carol adaptations and we just sort of thought that in you know in these complicated times especially when a lot of people aren't going to be able to spend the holidays with their families this year that we should get to celebrate again in July and and you know talk about talk about so many of the things Joanna that you have brought to the surface in this play. So we're hoping that, that lots of people will decide to join us for the virtual universe. It is the last week of July. Oh God, I should know the dates. Um, I think July 25th to July 29th. Please don't hold me to that. It will be on our website. Um, so join us in, in giving A Christmas Carol a deep read and talking more about the so many adaptations of A Christmas Carol that, that are out there in the world. So. No, this is certainly not a um, not a lead into that, but it's a very, very good introduction to some of the things that we're hoping to do this summer. So thank you so much, Joanna, and thank you to Karen and to all of the, uh, the actors who just read this so, so beautifully. Um, also to Helen Eberbach, who has been working behind the scenes here to make this come off so beautifully. And to Courtney Mahaney, who has also been working tirelessly behind the scenes to, to bring this all off. Um, and I, am, I missing, am I missing anybody else who's been working behind the scenes? Uh, Kristen Palma at uh, UCSC Special Events was a huge help publicizing and also helping us with some technical issues. So thanks, Kristen. Thank you so much, Kristen. Um, and if uh, now I realize I have no idea what to do now. <laughs> I just want to thank everyone for um, attending the show and hope you'll join us again in the future. And uh, check out the Dickens Project website. Get all the information you need about next summer. By the way, the reader's whiskers are real, just so you know. <laughs> Oh, yes. He grew them just for the show. <laughs> Things we have time for during COVID. 